I'm Rebecca with 1C, and this is Silent Crash. Every character in a story, real or imagined, has a motivation, a reason for doing what he or she does. Sometimes, often, really, there are multiple underlying motives at work. Humans rarely just do things to do them. We respond to our inner values and purposes, as well as external factors like our reputations and authority figures. When many of you wrote in to tell me to follow the money, You are urging me to find out if money was a motivator in this story. What I found? Well, suffice to say we're about to get deep, deep into the thick of it. When I went to Michigan last week, I asked every person I met for their thoughts on why this catastrophic reform was made to the auto no-fault system in Michigan. Holy Moses, did I get a plethora of answers. One that was spoken more than once was a rumor about the richest man in Detroit, Dan Gilbert, working with the mayor of Detroit, Mike Duggan, to coerce the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, to abandon her stated commitment to auto no fault and sign a reform bill. Now, I'll confess, I knew next to nothing about any of these people when I was told the rumor. I live in Florida and am from Tennessee. Dan Gilbert, Mike Duggan, and Gretchen Whitmer are not big public or social scene players in these states. There is truth, though, in a fresh set of eyes holding the possibility of bringing something new to the table. So I picked one of those names and started digging, mainly because of your suggestion and who he is. I dug into the money. And as I learned more and more about this man, I couldn't help but be reminded of another man I met while in Michigan, a very different man. In today's episode, I want to tell you about both of these two men. One is a businessman, a self-made billionaire, a mover and shaker in a prominent Michigan city. Some call him a savior. Others have more colorful descriptors for him. The other man is a 19-year veteran who served this nation in multiple countries, executing covert missions before his motorcycle accident forced a medical discharge. If you're unfamiliar with the auto no-fault laws in Michigan or the situation that led to the catastrophe currently happening and growing there, please pause this and jump back to episode one for details. Now, a quick ad break and we'll get on with the story. Welcome back. Let's get to it. It's 2007. The final Harry Potter movie is releasing. Apple is introducing its newfangled gadget, the iPhone. Nancy Pelosi is elected as the first female speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Rupert Murdoch is buying the Dow Jones and Company, making him owner of the Wall Street Journal. And Daniel Gilbert is approaching officials in Detroit about moving the headquarters of his company, Quicken Loans, to the city's crumbling downtown. Three years later, another of Gilbert's companies, Roscoe Development, signs its first development agreement with Detroit's Downtown Development Authority. It's for a historic property, the site of Hudson's, a department store started by Joseph Lothian Hudson in 1881. For a while, it was the tallest department store in the world, It sprawled across 25 floors, two half floors, a mezzanine, and four basements. Its largest freight elevator could accommodate a semi-trailer. This property was huge, and not just in size, but in its presence in Detroit history. Hudson's closed 90 years after it began, on January 17, 1983, due to the decline of Detroit. In 1998, its massive structure was imploded. As the Detroit News wrote, a symbol of glamour for three generations, 
a symbol of decay for another. The mammoth structure wobbled like a drunk, hesitated, then collapsed into a 60-foot-high pile of rubble, coating downtown streets with a fine gray dust. Until Dan Gilbert came along. An important detail to know here is that Gilbert's agreement with the Downtown Development Authority required that he show proof of financing for his building intentions at the site. That would be paperwork from a bank loaning him the money, or paperwork showing his company had the assets to fund this big move. Keep that little detail in mind. For the next few years, Gilbert goes on a buying streak in Detroit. The media covers it every step of the way. This is the man who is going to turn Detroit around. He's going to build housing and commercial space. He'll draw everyone back. He's the man, the savior. Michigan's kid is giving back to Michigan. What got left out of so many stories I read was what Gilbert got out of all those deals. Sure, he could have been doing all this from an altruistic place of wanting to restore Detroit, or maybe he was a man making millions of dollars on development deals to grow his companies and enjoying his growing stature amongst the elite. It could have been either. could have been both. What we do know is that by 2017, only 10 years after Gilbert first approached Detroit officials about moving Quicken Loans downtown, he had acquired just under 100 properties, totaling 16 million square feet in downtown Detroit. His net worth, according to Forbes, had ballooned to $5.8 billion. Dan Gilbert had become Mr. Detroit. Another of his companies, Bedrock, broke ground on the Hudson site in December 2017 with a projected completion date of 2023 and a $900 million price tag. Mike Duggan, the mayor of Detroit, was by Gilbert's side at the groundbreaking, a giant smile on his face. A month later, the announcement was made that the county gave Dan Gilbert a property he had long prized. It's called the Jail Fail Land because it was supposed to be the site of a jail, but cost overruns and delays had caused the project to be abandoned. It sat as an eyesore for several years. Gilbert thought it was too prominent of a place for a jail in the first place and made a bid for the land. He reportedly thought a soccer stadium could work well there. Shortly after making his offer for the land, the media carried the story that Gilbert didn't have to buy it to acquire it after all. He just had to agree to build a jail for the county elsewhere, and they'd give him the failed jail site. The deal was announced in 2018. A $535 million jail would be built at I-75 in Warren. The county would cover $380 million of the cost. The rest would be on Gilbert to pay. Now, I tell you about this deal because it feels odd to me that around the same time the county was working a land swap for Gilbert to take a high-profile piece of land in exchange for building a jail elsewhere, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation sent a memo to the board of the Michigan Strategic Fund. This memo was regarding that very first development agreement that Gilbert signed back in 2010, the one for the Hudson's property. Remember it? What was the detail I told you to remember from that? Don't worry, my memory isn't great either, so I'll remind you. Gilbert's agreement with the Downtown Development Authority for the Hudson's property required that he show proof of financing for the project. Turns out, Gilbert never showed that proof. And now, Gilbert was wanting to add to the deal. In addition to the Hudson's property, he wanted incentives for a property called the Monroe Block and some others. Now imagine, you're the mayor of Detroit. Here's this, at this point, billionaire buying up properties in your city, building a profile as a savior of the city. Are you going to do everything in your power to keep this gravy train rolling? Is that how Dan Gilbert got $618 million in tax incentives awarded to him by the Michigan Strategic Fund without providing proof of financing for those projects or future tenancy for the buildings? Hmm. The mayor did have a giant project on his hands with Detroit. Crumbling buildings everywhere, abandoned houses being used for all sorts of behavior that further destroyed the city. 
I can see how and why he would be thankful to have someone like Dan Gilbert in his corner helping to turn the city around. The mayor's city also had literally the highest auto insurance premiums in the entire United States. You know, it's often said that insurance premiums in Michigan were the reason for the reform legislation. But Senator McMorrow did the research on this, and she has shared it. Most of Michigan was paying right about the middle of the road average compared to the rest of the country. Only Detroit and a couple of other low-income, crime-ridden areas in the state were subjected to these exorbitant insurance premiums. That's important. The insurance premium problem existed in Detroit, not in Michigan as a whole. But according to what I was told, the mayor saw it as a Michigan problem, and he enlisted Dan Gilbert in a quest to address it. Now look, I don't know if that is true, but I told you from the start that I'm working to uncover how and why this awful PA-21 and PA-22 were passed. Part of that is telling you what I've found so far. Your feedback, ideas, and leads Help me get closer and closer to the truth unfolding underneath all of this. So all I can do is tell you the theories I have heard and what I've found so far. When I was told that Dan Gilbert, a man who is known to lean Republican, joined up with Detroit's Mayor Mike Duggan, a Democrat, I immediately asked, why? Why would Dan Gilbert do that? Was it because he needed the mayor to push through tax incentives on his projects Projects he did not show proof of financing for? Dennis Bernard, who is president of the Bernard Financial Group of Southfield in Detroit, told the Detroit Free Press that the Hudson's and Monroe Block projects couldn't be done without tax credits. Quote, this couldn't have happened without the state, he said. Construction costs are so high and our rents are not there yet. End quote. So Gilbert needed those $618 million in tax incentives that he got, and he didn't get them by providing the documents that were required. So how did he get them? And around the same time, also get a land swap deal that gave him a piece of land he'd coveted. Was it a relationship with the mayor? And what was expected of Gilbert after those tax incentives and land swap deal were awarded? I don't know. Here's what I was told. And again, I don't know if this actually happened. I was told that Gilbert and Mike Duggan went to Governor Whitmer. Remember, she's a Democrat who ran on a slogan of fix the damn roads. Now she needed funding to fulfill that promise, and she was working with both a House and a Senate whose majorities were Republican. Remember, too, that she had always steadfastly stated her commitment to not changing the auto no-fault program, to protecting the people whose lives depended on it. Remember, too, that Duggan wants insurance premiums to come down in Detroit. And that on May 7, 2019, the Michigan State Senate passed a bill reforming the auto no-fault program. The bill was now headed to the Michigan House of Representatives. The Senate passed it on May 7. It's now headed to the House. If the House did the required three readings and passed it, the decision to sign or veto would land on the governor's desk. On May 16th, nine days later, the House conducted the first reading of the bill. Remember, three readings of a bill are required before a vote on whether to pass it can be made. On that day, the bill was referred for a second reading. Weirdly, the second reading did not happen for eight more days. What was happening in those eight days? Was that when Gilbert and Duggan went to Governor Whitmer with a plan? I was told they presented her with a deal of sorts. Sign the legislation the Republicans were putting forward to reform auto no fault. If you don't, Gilbert will put his considerable wealth toward a media blitz to convince Michigan citizens that auto no fault is the worst thing ever for them and needs to go away entirely. He'll also make sure your rival has plenty of funding come Election Day again. If you do this, though, if you go along with this and sign it, Gilbert will use his wealth to persuade the existing Republican legislature to fund your road fixes. So the governor can either go along with this, 
save what she can of auto no fault rather than let Gilbert's money convince everybody to tank it altogether, and get the money to fix the roads, or not. Now, this scenario has been given to me by more than one person. I did not give it any more credence than any other theories until I ran across an article in the Detroit News from May 22, 2019. At this time, the bill has not been brought before the House for its second, much less third, reading. The article's opening line reads, quote, Calls to reform the state's no-fault auto insurance laws reached a crescendo after Dan Gilbert, the Detroit billionaire investor, signaled he would start a petition to get the issue on the ballot. Y'all. That's public record of Dan Gilbert saying he's going to ask the citizens to decide. Now, why would he feel confident doing that? The citizens had been asked if they wanted to change auto no fault before, twice, and they voted overwhelmingly to keep the legislature's mitts off of it. That's public record. Why did Gilbert see a citizen vote as something that would go his way now? This is where my fresh eyes might add something to this mix. I'm in Florida. We used to have a big tax incentive program in place for film and television production here. Let's say you were going to shoot a million dollar movie here. The state's program would award you up to 30% of that cost in tax incentives. That meant a producer only needed to raise $700,000 to make the movie, not a million. But in 2012, the ultra-wealthy Koch brothers decided to put their considerable wealth behind ending those incentives in Florida. They funded politicians and engaged in an overwhelming propaganda campaign. It worked. The majority of elected officials and citizens came to believe that film and television production tax incentives were horrible for the state. Today, the entertainment industry barely exists here. The business moved to Georgia where there's a healthy tax incentive program and where, coincidentally, the Koch brothers have stakes in film and television production studios. So yeah, it's entirely possible that Dan Gilbert or anybody else could throw money behind a propaganda campaign and convince the citizenry and elected officials that auto no fault is the boogeyman ruining their lives. In that same article in the Detroit News, Gilbert is quoted as saying, quote, This is a strong governor who wants to do the right thing for the state. I don't think she is going to let anybody, including us, determine what's best for the state. Aside from the threatening mob-like nature of that statement, I came away from it with a bigger question. Who is this us? Gilbert said, I don't think she is going to let anybody, including us. Who is the us he's referencing there? Him and Mayor Duggan? Him and the Republican leaders in the legislature? Who? He went on to say, quote, About 60% of Detroit drivers don't carry insurance because it's unaffordable. Something is wrong with that picture. This is the single biggest obstacle in making Detroit and the state competitive, end quote. But the rest of the state's insurance premiums were right on average with the rest of the country. And, quote, single biggest obstacle? To making y'all competitive, that year and the year before, Detroit had the third highest murder rate of the entire nation. You think people weren't moving to Detroit because of car insurance premiums? And even if Gilbert did think the single biggest obstacle was insurance premiums, his grand plan was to impact the $200 part of a several thousand dollar a year premium? That makes no sense, unless Dan Gilbert is a moron, and I don't think. Dan Gilbert is a moron. Neither did State Representative Sherry Gay Dagnogo, who said, quote, if he, Dan Gilbert, if he's truly interested in addressing the root causes of high rates in Detroit, assist with convening a task force which encompasses Democrats, Republicans, and every other stakeholder to get a compromise deal. He could use his money to pay for actuarial data to determine if a Detroit footprint-only pool with rates negotiated with hospitals and whether post-acute care would work. Don't try to muscle a path to a bill referendum that will ultimately fail. See, even she thought a referendum, a citizen vote, would not go in Gilbert's favor of getting rid of auto no-fault. 
Did you catch that at the end of her statement? She said, don't try to muscle a path to a bill referendum that will ultimately fail. But did Gilbert trust that it would not fail if he put his money behind a propaganda campaign aimed at citizens? On May 24th, 2019, the House was called into a special session. During that session, they did not only the second reading, but also the third reading of the bill and passed it around 2.30 in the morning. That same day, Dan Gilbert was having a dinner party at his apartment at the Vinton House in downtown Detroit. He began having double vision, but attributed it to a show happening outside that included lights and lasers. His hand started shaking, but he chalked it up to a new workout he'd had with his trainer that morning. Lucky for him, an ER doctor from Beaumont Hospital was one of his dinner guests. The doctor urged Dan to go to the hospital and get checked out. Dan was taken there by his personal driver. The next day, while at the hospital, he had an ischemic stroke. He would be in ICU for weeks. While Dan lay in the ICU, the signed bill gutting Michigan auto no fault was presented to Governor Whitmer on Mackinac Island. She signed it the next day on the steps of the Grand Hotel. Weeks later, Gilbert was transferred to the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, a rehab facility in Chicago. I listened to Dan Gilbert talk about his experience on the Cranes podcast where he was interviewed by Chad Livingood, Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans, and Aaron Walker, Chief Communications Officer of Gilbert's development company Rock Ventures, hovered nearby during the interview, occasionally correcting or restating some of Gilbert's statements. In the interview, Gilbert spoke of wanting to have a state-of-the-art facility like the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in downtown Detroit. He said, quote, And I have the fortunate situation of having resources. I start thinking about imagining people who just don't have any of these resources. What do they do? I mean, insurance does not usually cover most of the rehab from a stroke, maybe some of it, but not most of it, end quote. And I nearly fell out of my chair. Is he serious? The man who is rumored to have used his considerable wealth and influence to destroy the system that people paid into and that was meeting their medical needs at every turn in every way is now noting how important insurance is to rehabilitative care and wondering aloud what people do who don't have resources like he does. But Gilbert did not stop there in apparent blissful ignorance he wanted to make sure to give respect to nurses, saying, quote, I have no idea what they get paid, but I'm certain they're underpaid because you can't pay them enough. They're just incredible people. I mean, none of us would do for 20 minutes what they do nine hours a day every day of the week, end quote. Are you serious, sir? Before the changes you helped push through, Nurses and home health attendants and home caregivers were being paid for every hour they worked to do those thankless tasks of which you are apparently now aware. You reportedly used your wealth and influence to cut their pay by 45% for outside hired ones and from unlimited hours to eight hours a day for one person for the other's the whole system's gone belly up. 23-year-olds are being shuffled into nursing homes. Others are losing their homes entirely and living on the streets. Nurses are out of work. The businesses that employed them have been forced to shut their doors. And now you say that, quote, you can't pay them enough. They're just incredible people. Do you hear yourself, sir? But he didn't stop there either. He kept talking, and bless you, Chad Livingood, because if you'd stopped him, we may never have known what he admitted next. Dan Gilbert said, quote, I don't know if it, he's talking about his experience of having a stroke and going through the rehab system, that's the it. I don't know if it taught me anything about the economics of it, 
because I didn't really pay much attention to or worry about the insurance. I mean, why would you? Like you said, you have resources. But 18,000 car accident survivors in your state relied on the insurance they bought. They are not billionaires or even millionaires. They are hardworking people who paid their insurance premiums every year and found themselves in the horrific position of needing to use the benefits for which they paid. Benefits that are now gone because of, in large part, you, Mr. Gilbert. Take, for instance, the 10-year-old girl right there in Detroit, the city you purport to love. She is having to catheterize her own father every day, Dan Gilbert, every day, because the home health aide couldn't afford to stay after you championed a 45% cut in their pay. You've been in the healthcare system now, so you know what a catheter is. That little 10-year-old girl is having to see things she shouldn't see. And she has to worry that if she doesn't do it right, the complications could lead to her dad's death. She has to do that because you helped get her dad's care cut. Care that was covered by a fund with more than enough money, $23 billion, to continue for years. Michigan had a system to prevent this very atrocity from occurring, the Auto No Fault Fund. And yet, a billionaire came along and destroyed the system, so now that Detroit man's little girl has to catheterize him every day to keep him alive. This is what you have wrought, Mr. Gilbert. So did you come to Detroit back in 2007 with an honest-to-goodness altruistic intent? Did you just want to revitalize the city? Or did you come to make money and be in the elite? As I speak... Forbes values Mr. Gilbert's wealth at $31.7 billion. You did not need access to the $23 billion in the MCCA fund, the money that Michigan drivers paid in case they needed major care due to a catastrophic car accident one day. You didn't need their money. Why did you get involved here, Mr. Gilbert? Was it a favor to your friend, the mayor? Was it a thank you for his help in getting those hundreds of millions in tax incentives for your downtown projects? Was it just fun to have amassed the wealth and power to be able to manipulate a governor and therefore impact an entire state? What was it to you? I don't know those answers, but I do know what your actions wrought in others' lives. Let me introduce you to another man, dear listener, and Mr. Gilbert, If you're listening, you'll want to hear this next part, too. Uh, Laszlo Sela'i. I live in Brighton, Michigan, and I'm 55 years old. Laszlo is a veteran. I joined in uh, July of 85. I served in Nicaragua, Honduras. I had served in the Gulf War, the first. And then I... Worked for the government from 95, 94, 5, 6 in Iraq. Then I went to Bosnia, back to Afghanistan in the early years of 2000, 99 through 2000. And then, as I hear from every patient or caregiver I meet, one instant changed Laszlo's life forever. May 13th, 2012. I was on a motorcycle and was hit by a vehicle. Laszlo suffered multiple injuries. Compound fracture of the femur, tibia, uh, uh, L4 was punctured. Um, Brain injury, brain bleed, damage to the front lobe, occipital, and audiator, parts of the brain, and my vision. I was on Hold on, a, a week, and then they discharged me, and they were going to put me in a home. <laughs> I didn't want to go to a home. Well, you got to understand. Laszlo had reached the end of what is known as the acute care period, 
He was stable. He did not need to be in the hospital, they thought. He needed to shift to post-acute care, the part that can include long-term, sometimes lifelong, rehabilitation services, occupational therapy, speech therapy, that sort of thing. His injuries were stable enough that he wouldn't immediately die from them, but he needed ongoing care to get his life back. And he would need help not only from people who provide that care, but also people who could drive him to that care and see to his needs in the meantime. Up until that time, I was a functioning, well-functioning individual on my own. Then they tell me I have to go to a nursing home. I refuse. That's when my friend stepped in because I don't have a family member. I'm Candy Cutie. I live in Brighton, Michigan, and I'm 63. Candy was Laszlo's neighbor and so friend at the time. I got a phone call, and he didn't have any family in the state. He couldn't drive. And initially, we had no idea the injury was as bad as it was. Candy, a special education teacher at the time of Laszlo's accident, thought she was just stepping in to help a friend and neighbor out for a little while. We didn't know the brain injury. I knew his speech was off. And what they told me is it was the medication, don't worry about it. And one of the doctors came in and said they missed a brain bleed and told me what to watch for. When I brought that to the attention, they just kind of blew it off. So it wasn't until it gradually more and more started happening. We, he, a few months later, we noticed he started twisting his arm, and I mentioned it to his one doctor. I want to back up first, his chiropractor was the one who referred us to a neuropsychologist. And he told him, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with you, but just for your own peace of mind. Well, he knew better. Oh, thank goodness. Um, But that was a way to get him there. And he was like looking at me on the side and talking about his speech being off and said, you know, something's wrong here. And that was when the brain injury was diagnosed. And after a few months, we started noticing he would talk and he would like stop midway or he would twist his arm a certain way. And when I mentioned that to Dr. Terry, he asked me to make the movement again. I just did it automatically, repeating what he said. And he said, that's the start of seizures. And then he started having freezing seizures. So we knew then he couldn't drive. He wanted to go back to work so bad. He taught at both high school and college. We knew he could not go back to the college. He was swearing and didn't realize it. He could get explosive. I smile hearing this part. Laszlo reminds me of my brother-in-law, Randall Ricketts. Randall, too, was a war vet who served in the Middle East. He developed a glioblastoma multiform, the worst kind of brain cancer. The brain surgeries and treatments left him prone to bouts of anger and outburst. But at the college level, you don't have to keep track of how many tardies and contact the parents and, right. you know, worry about swearing. And the program he had was ex-cons. So the college, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the college allowed me to be on site and I helped him with his planning. So I took an early retirement. You heard that right. Candy, who thought she was just coming in to help Laszlo for a brief period of recovery, recognized that he would need long-term help and took an early retirement from her job. Remember that the MCCA fund before the reform paid friends and family an hourly fee for the time they spent helping patients at home. It was a recognition that the time was valuable and the person was giving something up to provide this care. In Candy's case, she gave up her seniority as a teacher, her teacher's salary, and all the insurance and retirement benefits that came with and grew every year she performed that job. I was so surprised to encounter this kind of kindness and generosity that I asked Candy to clarify. So you took an early retirement from being a special ed teacher so that he could stay in the college classroom teaching. And to get him to his appointments. And the college he went to was part-time so I could get him to his therapies in between classes or on different days because he only taught two days a week, but it ended up not working out, Um, and and he wasn't able to work after that. And what year was that? 2012. For nine years, Candy has served Laszlo as his caregiver. She still lives next door to him, but then... 
the auto no-fault changes went into effect on July 2, 2021. Candy is now only paid for 56 hours per week, not the actual amount of hours she works, which can easily be over 100. On top of that, she helped coordinate modifications to Laszlo's home because the insurance company said the MCCA would pay for it. But the insurance company is the one who told me I need the home mods. They sent twice their own people out to evaluate, and they promised. I actually put money out to get parts of it done. Don't worry, we're going to cover it. To this day, I ain't covered the dime. So they told you that you needed modifications and they would cover them, so you made them we and paid for them. We started what had to be done immediately, like in his kitchen, put out 31000 with the intent we would have a contract by the before it was done. What are those modifications? Because people who, people who aren't injured or don't have anything, like I remember some of the modifications we had to make to my sister's house when she was in a wheelchair, and I had never thought about things like, well, there are three steps leading up to your front door. How are we going to get in? We need a ramp. So what kind of changes needed the to be made to his home? Going into the garage. Steps. And I have an upper level home. I can't walk up steps. When I walk, well, I'm not supposed to. And I learned the hard way where I had a seizure and fell down a slight, uh, flight of stairs and <laughs> re-injured myself. I have surgery, recorrective surgery of the shoulder. and uh, They fixed the kitchen. They had to do different types of drawers, um, lowered things, okay. you know, make accessible. And that, they're like, yeah, you need that. Then they say, oh, he you needs need this. Non, like non-slip floors in the bathroom. The bathroom needs to be rearranged because he has glass shower doors that he can go through. He's got a walkout basement, so going down the stairs outside, it's very steep. There's no rail, so we wanted one rail on the side. He's fallen down those. He's had seizures since. He's had several injuries. His basement stairs are extremely steep and narrow, more than normal. So they're supposed to put them out wider. Haven't touched them. They even said they want to put elevator in my home. That would be helpful. That's what they were talking about. I said, "Hell no, I don't want. It. I don't. I don't like being injured." <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I don't want people to look at me like that. I mean, I have to wear exterior prosthetics to walk, right? Um, and beginning, like people look at me and they're like. The hell is wrong with him? Ain't not wrong with him, unless you see my my scars and all that that are covered. But I was tested multiple times by the by the CIA when I was working with them. My intelligence coach. <laughs> Last time I was in a room like this, I was being interviewed for my to be transferred into the CIA from the Marine Corps. Wow, it's weird. <laughs> Welcome to a different day. My IQ average between 140 and 143. My IQ dropped down to 99. And people, oh, but you're still normal. I'm not normal to me. You look at how you thought and how you talk and how you interpret things, and then you drop that 40 points. Most human beings that's walked this earth would be at borderline what they call, well, I, Retard station, you know. I mean, you're in your 60s because most people are 100, 105. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like that. I don't see things. I used to be able to do math, calculus, everything without a calculator. People knew it. I mean, it's not like I'm making it up. And I can't even use a calculator because I got to figure out how to use the formulas on a calculator. I can't remember. And I want to get the help. I work on it. I couldn't speak. I mean, I heard myself speak on tape, and it was like I sat in front of a mirror and practiced like you were three years old. I watch Laszlo's face closely as he tells me all of this. He is such a proud man, a strong man, a soldier who served his country well. I can see the pain there of being brought to a place of needing help for the simplest of things. But I had to support uh, support from people who knew me but really didn't know me. Laszlo is talking about a group of fellow vets who rallied around him to help. These guys, I met them th- 
three years after my accident. And they start helping me out. You know, Candace was doing everything. Doctors, my home, helping around. I mean, doing the stuff that needed to be around our home because I couldn't walk right. Couldn't pick stuff up. Then I have multiple surgeries on the shoulders, replacing shoulders already, both shoulders. I uh, lost a, hand, a finger in my hand because my hands don't work right. Um, but these guys started coming in and helping. Well, they got jobs. They got lives. So they're giving up their time, which they would they had no problem with. But you have to compensate. You tell me a person who's going to work for nothing. And if you have to spend a day with me, you'd see how hard it is to work with me. You know, you have to help me up, help me this, do this. Uh, but they did it, and now they're not going to get compensated for it. Why is that, Candace? Have they given you a reason why those vets can't be covered under the... We're talking about the portion of the law that changed that limits everything to 56 hours now instead of as much care as you need, as much attendant care as you need. But I'm a little confused because I thought... As long as the people didn't know you before your injury, then they still qualified underneath the reimbursement portion of the new law. But I guess, is this running into the 56-hour limit? Are there not enough hours left in the day to be able to reimburse the vets? He has a script for 24-7 care due to okay. expulsiveness, falls, poor choices, seizures. He has multiple seizures a month. So they're saying family can only do 56 so they will only they consider me family. So they will only pay me fifty six. They said we have to hire agencies after that. I've called sixty six agencies. There's nobody to take on auto now. Even if they do, he's really not a candidate due to his schedule. Um, and also he goes out of state a lot. They won't go out of state. We do have this core group that are all veterans or veteran support. So they've stepped up now to take over the extra 16 hours a day that I can't do, that the auto won't allow me to do. Mm -hmm. They are not a family member. They did not know him prior to his accident. And what's the third one? That's right. A friend. uh, Oh, you don't live with them. I thought it was. You You don't live with them. Oh, yeah. So they should. Anita Fox from DIFFS, she put out a bulletin that said, Anybody other than one of those three can do the care. It doesn't have to be an agency. So I submitted for last month and just found out yesterday that the insurance is not going to pay over 56 hours for him. So they are somehow being included in the 56-hour limit, even though they're, they're not in one Correct. of the three categories. They're, they're not a family or friend. They didn't know him before the accident, Correct. and they don't live with him. Correct, but they're saying we have to get an agency, and they know agencies aren't out there, and they are aware I have contacted 66 agencies. That's such an important point when people like Anita Fox say, well, your benefits haven't been cut. Well, we'll, you can still get your care. You can still get the services. Well, you no, you can't, not if they're all going out of business because you're not paying them. You called how many agencies? And they're all, nobody can take on anybody else. Let's look at what they say agencies, right? Every one of the veterans that helped me were either combat, they worked as medics, they were trained in the, in the field afterwards as paramedics or firefighters that had first responder and first aid care, every one of them. These folks are going to come to my home. I don't know about that. I have paraplegic friends. I have para, uh, 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 quads who have those people in their home right now. He's making a point I've heard from others. They had friends, family, neighbors, people they trusted to provide care that involves seeing them at their most vulnerable. So you've got your chosen group. You want your fellow vets to help you. Your fellow vets want to help you. you just want the program to work the way it's supposed to, where they get reimbursed. They care about me. And remember, Laszlo is still mobile, and he can still think quite well. He wants to live his life. That includes things like going hunting. Um, When I've called agencies, I've also asked, well, what happens about hunting? How does he get, you know, you send somebody out. At times, he's out in the woods at 4.30 in the morning. 
well, if he has to hire a transportation company, they can't transport him out at 4.30 in the morning. They're not going to wait and transport a dead deer back with him. <laughs> sure, well, you know? plus, I just had a mental image yeah. of that, of somebody well, in scrubs trying right. to help you transport But they also, have to, they also have to understand, they have to be in a, in, a, in a blind with me. They don't just leave me there. I'm not alone. You see this 24-7. There's somebody with me. In case you have a seizure? Yeah. What happens when you have a seizure, if I can be really well, well, invasive I in your have, life? I have a um, violent um, grand mal seizures now. So you shake. You oh, fall I down. I bounce around, they say. He I, drops like dead weight to the ground. I'm 263 pounds. I hit the concrete. I've messed up my face, my arms, my hands, my hips. I mean, I've I've injuries, not just a seizure. I had injuries at times. And then, you know, let's just go to the other part. You start having a seizure, and then people just start standing around. My friends, they block that. You think you're going to be laying on the ground, and you you urinate yourself on yourself. You defecate on yourself. These guys don't look, oh, no. No, they treat me like a human being. They're like, okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. They get me up. They get me out of there. They keep the people from staring at you. Mm -hmm. Ain't going to happen when you got, <laughs> I had firefighters taking, you know, up and up, um, EMTs come. They don't push the people. Away. They're like, hey, back up. But the people still stand there. These guys stop it. They treat me, they don't treat me different either. You're from strong stock. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people that would say, well, I could have a seizure at any moment, so I'm just going to stay home all day, every day. And you're like, let me go hunting. I'm good. Let me go live my life. Let me go speak. I don't want to be. I oh. see too many people sit and their lives are, and you know what's going to happen is, because of this, I can't go out as much as I like. I can't go do what I want to do all the time. Can you imagine you want an ice cream cone and you got to hope that you can get the ride there. Now, I did before, but now you're going to call, you know, I need a transfer to take me to the grocery store. I need a transfer to take me to the ice cream store. Can you imagine that? Put yourself in that shoe. And now they're telling me I can't even get the help. If I can back up just a minute on the, the seizures when you were mentioning it and with the friends mm -hmm. and, and what happens, frequently now this has become our core group. So he's not with one or with just me. It's we're frequently the group of us together. So he has a seizure. You've got a whole bunch of us here helping him out. And one example, he was, um, what do you call that, the MC thing at the Hamburg moving wall? Oh, I was, I was uh, um, the guest speaker or the honoree, the speaker. Oh, no, you were the one running it. Right, yeah, the MC. The MC. Okay. Yeah, so... Without my knowledge, they told me at the very end, this group, they had already figured out, positioned themselves all in different areas and had me right in the front while he was up speaking and already had a plan in place. So if he had a seizure, who was going to start blocking the stage? Who was going to block for me? Who was going to jump up and take over the speaker and start talking to draw attention away from it? So when we showed up, they told me, Candy, we've already got a plan in place. Wow. This was before we were doing stuff. This was just how we work cohesively. And now they want to take that away. And they've already told us they will not allow strangers from an agency to join them at the Friday morning breakfast. During COVID, we were in one, one of the guy's garages. They said, we're not going to have a stranger coming in here. Makes sense. And, and, and sitting in. We don't know who they are or what they do, what their belief systems are. Mm -hmm. And what we talk about, we share stuff. It's not just a support group because, oh, you know, no, um, the brain injury brings on post traumatic stress. Brought back memories that I have a hard time dealing with. They knew it. And the first two years after my accident, when I couldn't walk right, they told me, I ain't going to walk like you used to. You're not going to be a talk like you used to. You can't do what you used to do. I couldn't go to work. I can't do this. I'd get up, put a gun in my mouth in the morning. Mm. When I took that away from me, thought about hanging yourself, taking a drug. I mean, in a country that has an epidemic for opiates, right? Mm -hmm. They jumped me up with four a day or more 
just for my pain to take care of my pain. I don't like to do it, but I can't. And when I don't take it, the pain drives me into a situation that's even more irritable, ability, anger, depression. The only thing that saved me at that time is I didn't want Candace, who is an angel because she never asked for anything. She helps me with everything, even with my, my ignorant siblings, everything. And uh, I didn't want her to find me there. Mm. Now, when this is all gone, my biggest fear that I work with my docs, well, I got nobody that's going to come and find me now. So what am I going to do? That's my biggest fear because I still, now I went from being partially, I mean, I have someone with 24 hours, but some of those guys back off and they watch me, but they're not hovering over me. Mm-hmm. So they gave me some animated in again. Now, I ain't gonna have that. So I might bef- have been a home. So before you had twenty, it was twenty four seven. You had some at least one person with you, always, right? Because it was easy to do that because they could be compensated for yep. that time. Because as much as I want to make it clear to the people who listen to the show, it's not that the people are doing this for the money. It's that they're having to stop their money-making endeavors in their lives yes. to come be with you. So we have to offset that. That's why that was in the insurance coverage. Well, look at Candace here, right? She retired early. She gave up a bunch of money, right? Mm-hmm. Her retirement now is not full because no one was stepping up to help me. She has a house. She has bills. She has all this. And now she has to have something. My buddies who have part-time stuff, they have to give up hours. And they'll still, you know, they do it because they were compensated. I mean, who's going to work for free? Yeah. You can't. You can't pay your bills. When, and with, the, with everything going skyrocket high now, right? how are you going to do it? Well, it's. I mean, who can afford to give up the time because it's so expensive to live right now? It's... Even if I want to give eight hours to somebody that I love, if I, I, that's eight hours I'm not being paid, and I still have to keep yeah. the electricity running and the groceries right. and all of and the car payments and the insurance payments, which let's talk about that. So, mm. I mean, you had a contract. You had yeah. an insurance contract contract with your insurance company. Like everybody. And, yep. so, and all of this was covered before yep. the law passed in 2019. Yep. You had all of your 24-7 care. You had... No problem with any of that, whatever you needed. You might have had to argue with people to get it covered. That's insurance. But you had the promise that it was going to be covered because you had a contract in place, right? Yep. So we've we've massively impacted your care coverage. Do you have somebody with you 24-7 now? Yeah. They're just not getting compensated. Yep. Correct. So you're relying upon the goodwill of people now instead of what the coverage you paid for. I won't lie to you, listener. This is hard to hear. This proud, strong man served his country. He paid his bills, including his insurance premium, specifically so that he would never be in a position of needing a handout. And now, solely because of PA 21 and 22, the change to the auto no-fault program, this proud man is left hoping the goodwill of others doesn't run out. It even hits on the most basic of things, getting to see his parents. Laszlo's siblings are so uncomfortable with the outbursts and seizures his brain injury causes that they no longer spend time with him. But his parents miss him. They want to see him. He wants to see them. Just until recently again, my parents moved back to Ohio. They were in Florida being cared for by my sister and them. They moved back. I couldn't afford to go down to Florida even before this. Because I have my bills. Mm -hmm. I have a home. I keep a vehicle, pay my, and still to this day, pay my insurance, be on time, in full. Because I have to have someone drive me, you know, my friends drive me around my vehicle. Because it's been modified for me. Mm -hmm. But now, I want to go, it's a four and a half hour drive to my parents' house. Across the state line. Yep. Down in Ohio. They live in Youngstown. And... Like I said, my mama, she, my dad had a seizure when he was in his 70s. He was paralyzed in his late 70s. My mother never drove. And see, my parents came from a year, from Hungary. 
And, it, you know, back then, my mom would stay home, take care of six, five kids. She started driving to get my dad. So she don't like to drive on freeway. She's 84 years old now. My dad's 84. I haven't seen him in 16 months. As they were running in Florida, that now they're back. I want to go see them. Now I got to hope someone can take me down. Candace is going to take me down there. It's going to cost her time. Someone's got to do this. But she's going to do it. I can't hire an agency to drive me down there. But I'm not going to get paid. No, she's not going to get paid. They're only going to pay 56 hours. Which she's almost at right now. And It's Thursday. I so, reached out to them, and they just said I'm cut at 56. So 56 hours, if it's a four-and-a-half-hour drive, 56 hours is eight hours a day. Just the drive, forget the time that you spend with the parents. Once you get there, is not covered. Right. Correct. And because of the distance, we go for four days at a time. And so four days, 24 hours, that's like 96 hours. Correct. Forget the other three days that are left in the week when you even get home. 40 hours of the trip aren't covered. Correct. So is he just not supposed to ever see his parents again? That's what my question was to him. Yeah, oh, yes. And I said even, even their funerals. Their funerals would take longer than that. Is he not supposed to go? What amazes me is, I mean, he could go, but it's forcing him to rely on the goodwill of people when he paid for the ability to not live like that. Correct. Right. Correct. Or I can have an agency, they say. They won't go. But they won't go. Well, and they sure won't go when, they're, when their pay has been and cut then, by no. 45%. And, and exactly. And then I trust my friends <laughs> to come into my mom and dad's home. I don't trust other people coming to my mom and dad's home. Mm -hmm. But your other friends would just have to do this out of the goodness of their yeah. hearts because they're not going to get reimbursed anymore. Exactly. Either. Correct. That... To take such a proud warrior as you are, who put your, you put your everything in place that you needed to be able to live with dignity on your own with what you made, no matter what happened, yeah. and to take that from you and say, no, no, now you have to live dependent upon other people to just do things out of the goodness of their hearts for you. It's wonderful that people do, and I love that you have people in your life who will. I don't want to discount that, but... You had a system that you paid into to not be in that position. Exactly. Everybody has. And then, I mean, if you go into a store and you buy a television, you fill out the warranty paperwork, you go home. Three days later, your TV don't work. What are you going to do? Raise holy hell to get a new TV. Mm-hmm. It's a TV. 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 800 bucks, 1000 bucks. This insurance costed us 200 and some dollars a year for full coverage for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Not just medical, it covered the fixing of the cars, the fixing of a house. In your first three years, they paid you 80% of your lost salary. And they tell me, and let's just put this Lana Tice, the woman who wrote. Or sponsored the bill. She said she wrote, but she can't even explain it to me. She says she can't even interpret it. She said that to my face. This is not like hearsay. I asked her, what do I do? She explained to me, well, you got to buy a writer to go on top of your insurance to cover that. You know how much a writer costs? No. 400 and some every three months. So you're going to pay $1,300, $1,400 extra a year, hoping that that insurance at that time still going to cover you and honor it. When it was $200, $220 a year for this. And it's everybody. And people go, well, I'm, I'm healthy. I don't need it. Well, you know what? I was healthy as a heck. I was 46 year old. I can outrun 20 year olds. I can hump them out with 97 pounds on my back or more and do it. I served nine, almost 19 years protecting this country. I did 18 deployments into hostile times. I spent 5,860 some days in hostile environment, not just being over there. This was in hostility. Why I know that number, because we figured it out. We sat and we figured this out because I can't understand how people can go out, defend this country. We have rights. We have freedom. And two people, three people decide to crumple that up, 
throw it on the floor and hold us hostages because Lana Tice and uh, what's Shirky? Mike Shirky. Mike Shirky decide we're not going to hear this. Let's see how much damage is done. We got away a year. How ignorant. This is not even ignorant. This is plain ass stupidity. But it's not just that. They, why are they doing this? How can someone do this? Mr. Gilbert, do you have any answers for Mr. Laszlo? So two men, one, Dan Gilbert, who's made billions for himself, climbed into the elite. People praise him for saving the city of Detroit. But people in that very city are hurting because of him. A 10-year-old little girl, probably many more I haven't yet met. And that very city awarded him hundreds of millions of dollars to build those properties, money without which the experts say those projects could never have been done. He says nurses don't get paid enough. He says he, quote, didn't really pay much attention to or worry about the insurance, end quote, or even realize how insurance doesn't cover post-acute care before having a stroke and experiencing his own need for rehabilitation. But if he realizes how important all of this is now, why is he doing nothing to fix the problem he helped create? Why is Mr. Laszlo still suffering? Why is his medical care and 18,000 others still not restored? Only Mr. Gilbert knows the answers to those questions. And sir, you are welcome to come on this program and say them. You may have heard about Governor Whitmer's recent call for the MCCA to release $5 billion of its $23 billion as refunds for citizens. Two of my friends in Michigan who aren't affiliated with catastrophic car accident patients sent me links to the news that the MCCA answered Governor Whitmer's call. They're going to refund $5 billion. Is this a good thing, my friends asked? Is the problem solved? Sadly, no, for several reasons. First, remember that the people who paid into the fund... First, remember that the people who paid into the fund did so by sending their money to their insurance companies. It's the insurance companies who then send that money into the fund. So by law, it's the insurance companies who are members of the MCCA fund. So if the MCCA issues a refund, it goes to the insurance companies. It's up to them to decide how, when, or if they push those refunds through to their customers. Is this maneuver just a smokescreen? My friends are going to get checks for a few hundred dollars until I told them about this disaster unfolding in 18,000 lives due to the auto no-fault reform. They had no idea it was happening. They, like thousands more Michiganders, would have gotten a check and thought, yay, money, money I wasn't counting on. Insurance reform is great. They wouldn't realize that the check in their hand means Laszlo can't go see his aging parents. That 23-year-old Jake is languishing in a nursing home. That a 10-year-old is cathing her father every day. That thousands are out of work. That two women are losing their homes. That five people are dead. They wouldn't know that the check in their hands amounts to blood money. Would you want that check? It's something to think about. All of us here at Silent Crash are grateful for your listening support. The more people who listen and follow, the higher the ratings climb. And high ratings tell the legislature and governor that their actions are known. That's a powerful motivator. Also, when we reach a certain threshold of listeners, the show will bring in enough advertising revenue to pay for its production. Until that happens, though, we are reliant upon a GoFundMe campaign to offset the costs of production. The irony is that the people we're making this show to help, those catastrophic car accident patients, 
are not the people who can financially support this show because they're now struggling to keep their medical care going. But this show also benefits every Michigander with car insurance. Your promise of lifelong medical care in the event of a catastrophic car accident is impacted too. If you go out and, God forbid, have a car accident today, you'll be hard-pressed to find caregivers who can work at 55% of their pay, and your family won't be compensated beyond one person, eight hours a day, for quitting their jobs to take care of you. This affects all of Michigan's drivers. If you can, please give to the Silent Crash GoFundMe effort so that we can keep telling these stories and so that I can keep digging into the why behind this mess and hopefully turn it around. You can find a link on the Silent Crash Facebook page or on our website, silentcrash.net. Thank you for listening. Follow and subscribe to Silent Crash, the quiet unraveling of Michigan's auto no-fault and the destruction of lives wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on what you've heard here and how you can help, visit silentcrash.net. Silent Crash is a production of the 1C Story Network. The show is written by Rebecca Seitz and produced by her and Rebecca Bond Tucker. Post-production services by Zischer LLC. This show is supported by the generous donations of concerned individuals via the Silent Crash GoFundMe effort. Learn more about the 1C Story Network at JustOneC.com. That's J-U-S-T-O-N-E-C dot com. One C Story Network for the love of stories.